Well, it is our summer schedule. I'm still waiting for some people to come in. I am. I'm waiting for people to come in and go, and sit down really quietly as if they've been here the whole time. And if they do, I'll make sure to point them out to you. No, I won't do that. I won't do that. It is good to be here this morning. I would like to take a moment and acknowledge our Sunday school teachers because for the past nine months they have been teaching and doing such a great job. If you've been a Sunday school teacher, either your own class or a group teacher in the group that I oversee, would you please stand? There you go. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Christina, you didn't stand, did you? Oh, go ahead and stand. There we go. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and Christian, did you stand? Okay, we're clapping for Christian. Okay, sit down, guys. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but there was an alto singing this morning who is mysteriously hiding in the front row. Christina joined the worship team for background vocals today and did a great job. We appreciate that. Okay, uh, let's see. July 16th. Curtis, what do we have going? Okay, we're having a block party here. We have got signatures from our... Well, four neighbors right here, so we can shut off the streets, put detour signs and little orange cones. I've always wanted to have an event where we could put orange cones out in front of the church. We're going to have a block party, an opportunity for us to get to know our neighbors. And I tell you, our neighbors are excited about it. They're looking forward to the opportunity to get to know other people in the neighborhood. So we're going to have a great time for that. So maybe put that on your mental calendar, July 16th, in the afternoon, roughly 3 to 6. We'll get that figured out. If we're real lucky, maybe we'll have a dunking booth or some way to get wet there. Uh, but it'll be a good time. Okay, I've got a joke for you, and then I'll get to my sermon. You ever hear a joke that's just so funny you have to share it? And if you're offended at somebody mentioning the word bar from the pulpit, you can, you can uh, go out for a moment here. A mushroom walks into a bar and says, I'll have a beer. The bartender says, we don't serve your kind here. The mushroom says, oh, come on, I'm a fun guy. Okay. I don't know. I heard that yesterday and thought, I have got to tell that. I couldn't work it into anything, so I just give it to you for free. Happy Father's Day. I'm glad that you're here. I uh, do ask that you would pray for me and my uh, beloved bride as we uh, go to Nebraska This week to tend to some specific needs in her uh, families uh, with her father. You're going to be in good hands this next week. Prayer meeting is going to be taken over by elders. And next Sunday, Dan's going to be preaching. We look forward to that. So you're going to be in very good hands. And we'll be back the uh, first part of July, the Lord willing. Uh, We're in 1 Samuel chapter 23 now. If you don't have your Bible, it's on page 210. 1 Samuel 23 is a series of scenes or scenarios probably covering several months' time, that all seem to be variations on a single cohesive theme of God's guidance. In this chapter, we have stories of David and stories of Saul, and uh, David will illustrate to us the security and the success that is ours for seeking guidance and following the guidance of God. Saul will take the contrasting teaching role in this chapter and show us the futility and the failure likely for those who don't seek God's guidance. And therein lies the freedom of choice that each one of us has. Security and success or futility and failure. Which would you like to have? And as you answer that question, let's carry on. A little review from last week. We uh, looked at the first two scenes from verses 1 through 14. Verse 1 through 5, we saw that David delivered uh, Keilah. And then in verses 6, I think, was it 6? Yeah, 6 through 14, uh, God delivered David. We considered the idea that Christians shouldn't get so concerned about consulting God on every trivial issue of life, but that we should love God and read the Word, walk in the Spirit, and live life. And if God has something for us to know that's not in Scripture, I believe that if we're in tune with Him, and God really has a specific direction, He will let us know. With that guidance on the issue of uh, direction from the Lord, last of all, we considered what a fortunate place we find ourselves when we are right with God, when we're listening to Him, when we're seeking Him. Today I want to finish out this great chapter on God's guidance and His gardens by looking at the uh, third 
fourth and fifth final scene of our drama. The third scene is in verses 15 through 18, and that's where Jonathan encourages David. David is in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh, about 10 miles southeast of Keilah. Remember, he left there because God had revealed to David through the priest Abiathar that remaining in Keilah would be unwise, unwise for David, unwise for his men, and uh, unwise for the city. David knew that God had spoke, and he knew that he needed to split, so he did. Verse 16, we pick up, and it says, Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horesh and encouraged him in God. Now, this will be the last time, at least as recorded in Scripture, that David will see his beloved friend Jonathan alive. The next time, at least revealed in Scripture, that he will see Jonathan, it will be uh, Jonathan's body that will be uh, rescued by the Gibeonites. Jonathan encourages David. They restate their covenants to each other. They kind of of flesh out some of the details in a little more uh, specific way. What a magnificent friendship these two had in the Lord. Do you have a friend like that? A friend that you share your heart with? A friend that you share your life with? And a friend who will come to you when you're in the forest of Ziph? Who will come to you at your worst and lowest time? I want to encourage you that if you don't have a friend like that, of course the Lord Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But I also want to encourage you that you find a friend with skin on. Somebody that you can share your life and and share these issues with. Now, this is a nice, warm, fuzzy story, but I do have to ask what this Jonathan encouraging David scene has to do with our topic of guidance. I think that we might consider this encouragement of Jonathan one of the perks of listening to God. Had David not sought the Lord, had David not listened to the word from God, had David not obeyed the word that God had given him, David would have died in Keilah, his men would have died, and he would not have had this this last opportunity to touch base with his dearest friend. Hindsight is 2020, of course, but I want to get across the idea that When we are right with God, when we seek Him, when we listen to Him, we put ourselves in position for just this sort of, who would have thought that this was going to happen? Blessing from God. You can call it a serendipity. You can call it a along the way. You can call it a coincidence. But David was where God wanted him to be and where God told him to be. And because he obeyed God and was there, this... Who would have thought this would have ever happened? Blessing came into his life. When God directs, I don't know about you, but I want to be there. I want to be there to pick up these blessings along the way. The uh, fourth scene is in verses 19 through 23, and that's a scene I'm calling Saul directs himself. Verse 19 through 23 tells us how the uh, folks from Ziph come to Saul and, and let him know that David is there in that forest. They not only rat on David, but they offer to King Saul to help him capture David. So Saul commissions them to do a little spying. Now what you might notice here is that Saul doesn't inquire of the Lord. He doesn't get his priest and say, Lord, should I go and get David? Will David be... He doesn't go and consult God, but he consults these people and asks them to go behind the scenes and spy. Verse 22, go now. Saul says to the Ziphites, Go now, make more sure, and investigate, and see his place where his haunt is. That's the New American Standard. I like that. See where his haunt is. And who has seen him there? For I am told that David is very cunning. So look and learn. Saul's plot, though, is doomed to failure because David is in God's hands. Remember that statement that I ended with last week. There was no snare that David could not avoid because he was right with God, because he was hearing God, and because he was seeking God. But Saul was seeking himself. Saul was directing himself. There's the old saying that goes like this, He who defends himself in court has a fool for a lawyer. 
Well, I think there's a, a Christian parallel to that. He who guides himself through life has a fool for a guide. Because if we're not seeking and listening to God, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. Allow me to be just a little bit more direct. If you are a Christian and don't seek God's guidance, if you're a Christian and don't tune yourself into God every day through prayer and through Bible reading, you are being foolish. Daily communion with God helps keep our minds safe, And our hearts tuned in. Those daily appointments keep us strong and they keep us anchored. Prayer is talking to God. Bible reading is letting God talk to us. And both of those are essential for us to survive through the day. They keep us in tune with God. I have a friend who took a vacation a couple of years ago to swim with the sharks off the Caribbean coast. He's one of those extreme sports kind of guys. They took him out into shark-infested water in a 7 by 7 by 7 cube and dropped him along with his buddy and a bag of raw meat into the middle of a school of very vicious sharks. Now, that wasn't enough to thrill this friend of mine. He decided to open the cage door and go out with him. We now call him Lefty. No, that didn't really happen. I just thought it was a funny story. Nobody would be so foolish as to do that, to go out and swim. Now, I know there's people who go out in cages. That's okay. I do that. Just cover my eyes and ears so I can't see or hear anything. But nobody would be so foolish as to go out and swim in the middle of a group of marauding, hungry sharks. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. (laughs) Nobody would be, thanks Curtis, I'm so glad you're there. He's got my back. Yet I know believers who do that every day. I know believers who do that, metaphorically speaking, every day. Psalm 119 is this great psalm about how the Word of God guides us and protects us, keeps us safe. One of my favorite verses from Psalm 119 is verse 10. With all of my heart I have sought thee. Do not let me wander from thy commandments. Verse 11, thy word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Another that I have thrown myself on many times. How can a young man keep his way pure but by keeping it according to your word? So the shark story wasn't true. I wonder how many of you are going to go out this week any day without the resources that God has given you. He who leads his own life has a fool for a guide. And Saul illustrates that by directing himself. The fifth and the final scene that I want for us to look at in verses 24 through 29 is God delivers David. Again, he already did this once. He's doing it again in these verses. Saul's hunt is on for David and the pace begins to quicken in these final verses of 1 Samuel 23. This is where the movie score would start to get tense. The drums would start their driving beat, so the emotions continued to get more tense. Maybe chords on the string section, maybe those uh, orchestral stabs, like in the shower scene on Psycho, you know. The music would start to do this if we were watching the movie. Uh, This is where you would lean forward in your seat. This is where you would stop and forget to breathe. This is where you would drop your popcorn and not care about it. Because the scene is getting really, really tense. You see, Saul and his thousands of soldiers learn David's location and they are hot on David's trail. David's scouts return to him with breathless news that the armies of Saul are on the other side of the hill. That the armies of Saul have begun to divide and come around to their side of the hill so that they would come in from every direction and surround and capture David. Verse 26 reads, And Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side of the mountain. You see, Saul was a tactician. Saul knew where David was, and he knew that David was in his grasp. David and his men were on the other side of the mountain. David was hurrying to get away from Saul. 
For Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men to seize them. This is my friends, as I read 1 Samuel, the closest David ever came to being captured. No, it wasn't when Saul's men waited outside David and Michael's home to capture him at morning light. No, it wasn't when Saul sent the emissaries and finally Saul himself came to Ramah to catch David when he was meeting with Samuel. Not even in that city of Nob. Nowhere do I find David within a hair's breadth, within scant minutes of capture. Yes, this is an exciting moment, and it is really tense. The question is, what is David supposed to do? He has sought God. He's obeying God. But it looks like his obedience, it looks like David's obedience has led him into a position where he is in trouble. It looks like he's a goner, right? All David has left is trust. And of course, we know that that's going to be good enough. But look what happens in verse 27 and 28. A messenger came to Saul. It's like Saul was rounding the corner ready to get him. And a messenger comes to Saul and says, hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid on the land. Remember, Saul took all of his soldiers, took all of his warriors after David. Remember the shotgun and the fly illustration? They have made a raid on the land. So Saul returned from pursuing David and went to meet the Philistines. It's like he's going, ha, ha. Nuts, i got to go home and take care of the Philistines. You don't have to bring in CSI to see God's fingerprints all over this situation. This is, is one of those inarguable coincidences where man's need and God's provision perfectly coincide. Now, I'm not a big believer in coincidences when it comes to a child of God. That would be like my children coming downstairs on the morning of December 25th and saying, Wow, there's presents here. And I'd say, Well, duh, of course there are. We put them there. It's Christmas morning. I had a Christian friend once who was a new tither, and this is a true story, not a make-believe story, who was a new tither who needed exactly $375 to pay a bill for dental work on one of his children. He got a letter in the mail the next day with an unexpected tax return. Can you guess the amount? It was exactly $375. Not a coincidence, not like, well, who'd have thought this would have happened? But a coincidence, a coincidence of man's need and God's provision. And do you know when these coincidences are more likely to happen? There's the old saying that luck favors the prepared. Well, my friends, coincidences happen when you are seeking and when you are following God. When you are walking in his will and obeying him. God guards the footsteps of those who are in line with his footsteps. Another way to look at this could be that old saying. Maybe you remember it. It goes like this. God's will won't take us where his hand won't keep us. You might write that down because I find that a profound application of this chapter. Many of you remember uh, Ron Elric when he ministered with the uh, circuit riders. We still support circuit riders, but Ron has gone home to be with the Lord. I remember hearing Brother Ron talk about a time when he was trying, this was shortly before he had graduated to glory, where he was trying to work inroads into a group of hell's angels that uh, resided in Idaho. Ron was sure that that's exactly where God wanted him to be. And felt that it would be an occasion for him to live and to share the gospel with those people. This led to a particular occasion where Ron wasn't sure he was going to make it out of this room with these guys 
alive. And I don't know what the flags were that went off, but, but Ronnie, he said, I was looking around for things I could use to defend myself if I had to. And I later asked Ron why in the world he would put himself in such a risky situation, not knowing the answer, but I thought it was good conversation. His answer went something like this. God's will won't take me. Or his grace won't keep me. I visited this past week with a young Christian man who is stuck in pornography. I asked him why as a child of God he did something that he knew wasn't pleasing to God. And his answer was, well, it's the lesser of two evils. He said, either I use pornography or I have premarital sex. I told him that he needed to stop feeding that monster which was living inside him and reminded him that obedience to God would keep him safe from both because God doesn't ask us to go where he won't protect us. This week I also visited with one of the uh, women in our church who was concerned about her family's finances and her not being able to fulfill her commitment to God and to this church that, that she would tithe. I reminded her that her tithing was God's will for her and her family. That tithing was the basis of responsible stewardship and not the cause of financial problems. And that God would surely bless her family for their faithfulness. Why? Because God's will doesn't take us where his hand won't keep us. So where is it with you? To what challenge or what obedience or what self-denial or what faithfulness is God calling you to today? What area of your obedience to God's will for you is giving you the willies? What are your concerns? What are the risks that are bothering you about saying yes to God in, in some area of your life? And folks, I've got to tell you, I have been exactly where you are, if that's where you're at this morning. Because it's not just love Jesus and life is cotton candy and rainbows and butterflies. Sometimes obedience is scary. Sometimes obedience is rugged. Sometimes I have literally weighed the cost versus the benefits of obeying God. Maybe that's a little bit too honest for the pulpit. But we see the potential negative results of doing what God wants us to do. And we wrestle with whether or not we should do it. Because, well, but if I do that, then fill in the blank. But remember, God's will won't take us where his hand won't keep us. Because where God guides, God most surely will guard Psalm 27 was a psalm written by David, and it applies so well to this point in time. Now, it's not an historical psalm that says, While David ran from Saul on the other side of the mount at Horeth. Psalm, one, or psalm 27 is great, though. It begins like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? So I want to encourage you not only to seek God's will, but when God says go or when God says stay or when he says give or when he says do or when he says stop or when he says whatever, that you stop letting the flesh cause you to weigh it out. Well, but if I obey God, then maybe this, that, or the other thing. But just simply to trust and obey. Isn't that a great hymn? To just trust and obey. Because I guarantee you, I've never once seen it go wrong. Where God's will leads you, 
His hand will also keep you. God bless you in your walk this week.